This situation down here, where we have an asynchronous architecture, is, is way more easy to plan for and handle large unexpected amounts of volume. So, let's get the scene set. So perhaps you might be in a world where you have some mainframe services. And perhaps you're looking to migrate into the cloud. Lots of different organizations are in different stages of this. Perhaps you might be here, perhaps you might be looking at this, and perhaps you might be in the next phase. And then again, perhaps you might be at that phase now where you're starting to put microservices into the cloud. Perhaps you're in AWS, GCP, Azure. There's plenty of options, and there's plenty more. So often the first step that people take when they're moving into the cloud is they move towards a microservices environment. So the most natural step that most organizations take is they will move to an implementation where they perhaps have a few services. So let's draw a few out. So let's imagine we have uh, an architecture here where we have requests coming in from the outside world. And then perhaps we have microservice A, which is talking to microservice B, uh, which is then talking to microservice C. And perhaps there might be a few database lookups happening in some of these services. So this all seems reasonable, and this is a fairly natural progression that many organizations find themselves in, because they want to get to a space where they can release code often, they can decouple teams, and they can start to think about the core components of their system and perhaps migrate away from a large architecture where all of this is one big thing. However, as your business scales, you may find that this kind of architecture starts to strain. So let's just look at a, a situation here. So, so let's say a request is coming in from the internet and then perhaps you require the response from service A to come back to the caller to happen in around 15 seconds. So what this actually starts to mean is that service A now needs to call service B, which needs to call service C, and all of this needs to happen synchronously and then respond to the user um, all within that time budget. And what this can start to do is it can start to really get very complicated because Perhaps your system starts with three services, but then over time, maybe more services get added. And perhaps a dependency comes in between here, and now suddenly maybe B has a dependency here. Things can really get messy quite quickly. And if you look at the state of lots of different companies' architecture at the moment, you'll see, and I'm, I'm disappearing behind this cloud of, of dots here, um, you'll see that many organizations have this architecture and, and what can originally seem like a very logical way to do things can get very messy very quickly. So today I'm going to talk about another alternative which doesn't work for all use cases but it's definitely worth considering for many use cases. And what it is, is moving, I will migrate down here, it means moving to a slightly different model of communicating between services. So, let's start with a bus. And what do I mean by a bus? What I mean by a bus is a way to asynchronously send messages between services. So, let's call this a bus. So, let's imagine this bus is I can put a message on this particular, we'll call it a queue, and then they will build up. And a service can be listening, or multiple services can be listening to the same queue, and when something happens, it receives a message and it can do something with it. So let's draw this 
ABC architecture using this asynchronous methodology instead. So let's stick the A service, the B service, and the C service. So let's imagine this, this previous flow. So the message comes in to service A, and service A will, instead of actually calling B directly, it will put a message down onto a queue. So previously we had the situation where B was the one who had to respond to that. So we're now going to have B listening to the queue that A is pushing to. And then B is going to do something and it's going to push its own output to its own queue. And we know that C cares about the output of B so C is going to be listening to, and I seem to have gone through a pen, so apologies for the color change. But so C is listening to the output of B, and then likewise, it's going to output to its own Q for which A can listen from. So at first, it might just seem trivial, the advantages that we can gain from this. But if we think about the way we can then deal with significantly different amounts of traffic or, or use cases. So, so imagine we now have a scenario in this previous one where perhaps we have a large event which is important to our business, where perhaps we get millions of customers in one day. What can happen here is we suddenly might be exposed to some significant hotspots or bottlenecks in the system. Whereas this situation down here where we have an asynchronous architecture is, is way more easy to plan for and handle large unexpected amounts of volume. So for example, as long as our A service can handle the initial inputs, we could potentially get uh, sent a million requests. And these requests can all just be put on this, this queue here. And our B service here can just chug away and do what it needs to do at its own time, and then just slowly drip these things back onto its topic and eventually just consumed through the items. So, you know, this A topic can just dump a million of my items on here and our system doesn't break. Whereas in this system here, if we dump a million requests on B, it's uh, very likely that system is going to fall over. So what this also means is we can then start to think about the contracts that services have. So the next topic we'll talk about here is schemas. And hopefully that fits on the board. So next idea is schemas. So we can then start to think about each of these components as isolated items in the architecture. So B doesn't need to know or care about how any of the other components work. All it needs to know about is the events it needs to listen for and have a standardized schema, which it pushes out, which any of these consuming services need to know the structure of. So schema is essentially a message structure. When what this means is instead of, if we have to add more services to here, we have to really understand all of the, the coupling and dependencies. Whereas here, we can add any number of services and we all already know what the schema output is. So imagine we were building a bank of this system and suddenly we had some new reporting requirement or perhaps some new ledger based view we needed to build off a system. We actually don't need to care about the entire architecture of the system. All we need to care about is the schema that B outputs. We take that information, perhaps we want to aggregate that with the schema that C outputs. So maybe we listen to these two topics uh, or um, cues. We build our view of the world. We output what we want to output and we're done. And it means that it really simplifies and improves our ability to build upon our system with a lot more confidence and um, reliability and, and knowledge that we're not going to break other things. So I think this was just a, a short overview of, of why this is worth being aware of this architectural pattern. And it's definitely not valid for all ways of um, building things and it's definitely there's some cases for example if you were building a bank perhaps if you wanted 
have fast, you know, sub uh, second responses to payments. Perhaps there's some use cases where it wouldn't model, but for most use cases, it works very well. Um, anyway, so I hope you've enjoyed this talk and perhaps uh, learned a few things and um, see you next time.